Good morning, and welcome to online worship with the First United Methodist Church of West Chicago. The last time that I was with you virtually, our family had already embarked on an epic road trip in memory of my dad. It was amazing, far better than I had anticipated, though at the same time an extremely emotional experience for me. We made it out to Sun City in time to celebrate my stepmother's birthday with her, and even managed to tent camp a couple of times, though hotels made it much easier for us to see more and to get further without the setup and teardown each day. We had the opportunity to visit 10 states, four national parks, and numerous points of interest along our way. It felt like we lived a thousand summers in just 10 days. This was essentially our first family road trip, but will likely not be the last. I'm incredibly grateful not only for the vast natural beauty that we beheld, but also for the chance to fulfill my father's plan that he died too soon for. I hope your summer is going well too. It certainly is different than last year, though not entirely like years past either. Pools and public libraries are again open, but under different guidelines. Summer celebrations are back on, family get-togethers are a go, and in 36 more days, my kids will be back in person for school for the first time since March 13, 2020. I know I am grateful for the return of some familiarity, but I'm also aware that things will never quite be the same. I am, as is everyone on this planet, forever changed from the compound trauma of the last 16 months. There is much to still make sense of, recover from, and adapt to going forward. But I trust that God will lead us through even the foggiest of circumstances, as he has done for his people throughout time. Our current series, Strange Encounters, is perfectly timed walking us through biblical accounts that similarly leave us wanting in our understanding of what was going on and what God was doing. By closely examining these texts, Pastor Avni is bringing us to a point of recognizing the goodness of God in even the most perplexing passages. And for our announcements this week, Vacation Bible School is now only eight short days away. Volunteers are still needed to help provide the program Courageous Faith in the evenings from Monday, July 26th, through Friday, July 30th. For more information, visit the church website, www.firstumcucc.org, or contact Linda Smith. Please join me in the opening prayer. O oh God, you are almighty and everlasting. You do not know fear. Yet, without you, we are as needs tossed in the wind. Gather and hold us securely in your almighty and loving hand. In Christ we pray. Amen. the worship. Come, all who would seek shelter in the arms of God. 
For the storms in life have been fierce and the pressure strong, yet those who would serve the Lord need have no fear. But the trees bend and the walls tremble, yet remember Noah, those faithful in the Lord will never be lost. Blessed be in the name of the Lord. Noah and the flood. Sin makes God angry and sad. Hello, children of God. Today's story is from the first book of the Bible called Genesis. It goes like this. The Lord saw how bad the sins of man had become on the earth. All of the thoughts in man's heart were always directed only towards that which was evil. And the Lord God was very sad that he had made man on earth. His heart was filled with pain. So the Lord God said, I created man on the earth, but I will wipe them all out. I will destroy people and animals alike. I will also destroy the creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air. I'm very sad that I have made man. God has feelings. It saddens him when we don't follow him. But the Lord God was pleased with Noah. God was pleased with one man on earth. One man. Only one man in his family followed God. Here is the story of Noah. Noah was a godly man. He was without blame. No one could blame him for anything. He was good. Noah walked with God. He followed God. Noah had three sons. Their names were Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. Remember, at that time when the earth was very sinful in God's eyes, it was full of mean and harmless acts. God saw how sinful the earth had became, and all of the people on earth were leading very bad, sinful lives. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put the end to all the people. They have filled the earth with their harmful acts of evil. You can be sure that I am going to destroy them, both them and the earth. God was so upset with how the people of the world were, he decided to wipe them off the planet. How would you have liked to have been Noah at that time? God had just told him that the whole world was going to be wiped out with a great flood over all the earth. God hadn't said anything to Noah yet about saving him. Then God said, So make yourself an ark, a boat, out of cypress wood. Make rooms in it. Cover it with tar inside and out. Here is what I want you to do to build it. The ark has to be 30 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. I'm sorry, 300 cubits long. An Egyptian cubit is about 20 and a half inches, which is 1.7 feet. Make a roof for it. Leave the sides of the ark open a little for the top. And put a door on one side of the ark. Make lower, middle, and upper decks. Whoa! The ark was really large. God said, I am going to bring a flood on the earth. I will destroy all life under the sky. I will destroy every living creature that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will make my covenant with you. A covenant is a promise, and God keeps all of his promises. God said to Noah, You will enter the ark. Your sons and your wife and your sons' wives will enter it with you. God wanted to save Noah, so God gave Noah specific directions on how he could be saved. He had to build the ark. He had to follow God's directions every little step in order to be saved. God fills Noah in on how he's going to destroy the earth, and he's going to send a flood. God tells Noah to bring two of every living thing into the ark. Bring male and female of them into it. They will be kept alive with you. Two of every kind of bird will come to you. Two of every kind of animal will come to you. And two of every kind of creature that moves along the earth will come to you. All of them will be kept alive with you. Take every kind of food that you need, store it away, and it will be food for you and for them. Noah did everything exactly how God commanded him. Noah did everything exactly the way God told him to do it. Noah loved God, followed God, and was faithful to God. So God loved Noah and saved Noah. We love God too. God sent Jesus to save us. We follow God too. And God loves us. Let us pray. 
Dear God, please forgive us for the times when we did things to make you sad. Help us to do things that make your world a better place to live. Help us to trust and obey you. Guide us that we may be a reflection of your love to others. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now, please join me for the prayers of the people. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, let us together pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today our scripture reading is from Genesis, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground, the daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Neophil were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went into the daughters of humans, those who bore children to them 
These were the heroes that were of old warriors of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will not blow it out from the earth the human beings I have created. People together with animals and creeping things and birds in the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we are now in the third week of Strange Encounter series. We talked about Strange Encounter, the bears, last week. And today we have giants uh, that we are going to talk about today. It's a strange story. It has different narratives, which is so difficult to put any mind to it. It has a supernatural uh, element into this uh, story. Uh, we read about uh, sons of God. We don't know who the sons of God and why are they roaming um, in the Old Testament? Why are they roaming on the earth? The first, uh, as I always say, that it is wonderful to read the whole uh, scripture uh, entirely so that we all may know what exactly it's happening. And as uh, was the case the last two weeks, the best way to start is to know what's going on in the scripture. Now, this is one of the most confusing passages in scripture. First, the narrative is presented in a disjointed manner. It doesn't flow chronologically, but skips around. Second, uh, two questions naturally come to our minds when we read this. Who are the sons of God? And who are these giants, these heroes of old roaming the earth? The first one can be resolved fairly easy. And, uh, you know, you can read from Genesis chapter 6 and you can say, well, yes, they walked on this. The strange encounter is a bit reminiscent of this net. Flex show Stranger Things. In that show, a group of children discover a gateway to a parallel world upside down that exists within the same time and space as where they are living. It is a wild show that really bends the mind. But it also reminds me of what we are talking about today. We inhabit a supernatural universe. Typically, the strangest passage we encounter in the Bible are just attempts to convey in our language and using our own words and understanding how the supernatural can break through into our reality. Here in Genesis chapter 6 is one example of overlap of the supernatural and the natural cohabiting on earth for a brief period of time. So back to the questions. Who are the son of God? And what are the Nephilim? Let's start with the son of God first. There is one God, but there are many supernatural beings, like we say angels of God. There are little details sprinkled throughout the Bible about these beings. The universe is ruled through what is known as a divine counsel. You can see it on Psalms 82 or 1st King chapter 22 verse 19 to 23. A claim of a mighty warriors, offspring of the sons of the God and daughters of the men. Some sort of half-breed angel children, as one writer puts it. It is a supernatural world we live in. The fact is, we don't know God did not choose to elaborate, explain, or emphasize these characters beyond these verses, except a brief mention of Nephilim again in the Numbers, uh, Book of Numbers. It remains mysterious, the world of wonder. The scriptures tells us this, and the Greeks understood this. 
The Romans got it. Even the authors of the fairy tale understood it at some level. But we have somehow forgotten this. The world seems to be losing its wonder. The sons of God are frightening creator, character, creatures and all the more frightening because they are real. We modern American Christians are bad at accepting mystery. But as difficult as it is, we must pause here and admit that even with the sum of a human knowledge in our pockets, we don't know everything. And we must say with Paul, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. There is an important caveat here. Yes, it is a supernatural universe in which we live. There is a spiritual dimension that interacts with our world on a daily basis. But everything physical and spiritual follows an order that God has created. We want to be very clear on this. What the sons of God did was not okay. It was similar to David's sin in the lusting for Bathsheba and abusing his power by having sex with him. There, there is a clear pattern in sin and you can see the threats of it here uh, with the sons of God and human, and human women. The sons of God saw the women and they noticed that they were attractive and many thoughts probably followed this recognition until finally there were there was an action. They took it any they wanted as their wives and they say it in that sense in the verse too. And God was angered and he punished them and, and the humans and he decided the limits, the lifespan of humans and he also decided to punish the giants and he did so first by the flood. Did you realize the part of the reason that God flooded the earth and the provided Noah's ark was because the sons of the God and the thing for human women. We tend to leave that out of the children's version. But that is how serious the scene was. God not only said, enough is enough. He said, I am starting over. I, this is a remarkable soft story. Just a few verses out of the book that is over a thousand pages long. Yet the consequences of this scene fill the pages of the Old Testament. In the short term, there is a flood and destruction of much of the earth as, much, as well as a shortened lifespan for humans. But more broadly, we see the scene is putting something other than God first in our lives. The consequence of sin is that it creates distance and suppression from us and God. For many generations following this event, a race of giants walked the earth and were continually an enemy to the people of God. These giants seem to have mainly settled in the promised land. You can see it on Numbers chapter 13, verse 32 to 33. So it's a strange encounter of the scripture for us and we are still confused about this giant. We do not know, but one thing we do know, what we know do know is that, that something happened that caused verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in the man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. Wickedness and evil are not anew. It's easy to watch the news and think things that never have been had bad, bad, but that's just not true. Here we see that only 10 generations into the human history, the wickedness of the man who uh, who was great in the earth. The Christians, we know, uh, as Christians, we know that the evil is ancient. And we remember that God is the most important factor. So let's see what we can learn about him in these passage, verses, verses 5 to 6. First thing that we see in the Lord, uh, that is Lord sees the scene. He sees the great wickedness of the man in the earth and the evil intentions and heart of his heart and he sees worldwide trends of greed, violence and oppression. He also sees the minute palpitations of the scene embedded in our motives and desires. Secondly, in verse 6 we see that the 
Lord grieves over the sin. Interestingly, right? How can God, who is all-knowing and all-controlling, regret something he has done? Bear in mind that the Bible uses the human language to indicate the divine realities. But a word like regret cannot fully capture what God feels. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, God told Samuel that he regretted having made Saul king in verse 10. Then, just 19 verse later, Samuel states, The glory of the Israel will not lie or have or have regretted, for he is not a man. So in Genesis chapter 6, uh, 6 we see that the God feels reg that he feels he calls regret. It's sort of a grief and a sorrow at what he sees in the world. But it's not the pain we feel when we have made a mistake. Do you think of God as emotional? Many Christians do not. They think of God as an unemotional, impersonal force or a machine. But he is being human. Emotions are reflections of his divine emotions. And we are made in his image. And God sees sin and it grieves him to his heart. He is deeply moved with the emotions over the wickedness and the evil. He sees it in the humanity. The thirdly, God, the God, Lord, response to the sin. God saw a widespread of wickedness and, and comprehend the evil of the uh, humankind and acted on it. God will not dare tolerate the sin. He insisted on justice in the world. And so he determined to erase men from the land. I heard a story some time ago of a riot. The rioters turned their wrath upon this man, surrounding him in the this violence and the local pastor was in the crowd and holding up the Bible and shouting in vain for the people to stop. He finally cramped himself through that circle of wrath until he, uh, he was upon the helpless man in the center. He laid on, uh, on top of him, holding the Bible over him for protection and absorbed the blows of the angry writers. This is the picture of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. A cycle or a pattern that is very familiar throughout the Bible emerges. Sin, then judgment, followed by mercy and hope. Suddenly an ugly story ends on the note of hope. Verse 8 almost surprises us by not fitting in this first seven verses. There is one righteous man whom God looks upon with favor. And so through Noah, God preserves creation. And through the line of Noah, God chooses to give us the true son of God, that is Jesus. Even in this strange story, we get a glimpse of the gospel. We see the God who will not tolerate the existence of sin. And yet at the same time, refuses to abandon his people. One day, the supernatural birth of the true God, Son of God did come long after Noah was gone. Our God was both within and outside of the created order to bring about this perfect will. It's interesting to see that the creation stories in the Bible, one that is seen in the beginning of the Bible where God created the world with nothing and by separating the water. Then second story again contains the water, the Noah's story, the water subsides and then the new life created. And the third, the final one is a living water through Jesus Christ. Only way we can have mercy and hope and recovery from our sins is through living water, Jesus Christ. Today's scripture is telling us something. It's telling us to come to Christ, accepting him, him fully, reclaiming him again, deep again in this water of baptism and to remember it. Sins are giants in our life, supernatural sometimes. Only way we can get joy is through Jesus Christ. You know, in this in this scripture, in this thing, I, I found one thing. You know, when we sin, God doesn't start from where we are. Actually, God brings us back again to the creation where we are and then starts us new. I hope that you, that comes, that you may find again your road towards God. I hope that you know that God has not given up. 
He's going to keep creating and keep uh, keeping you close to Himself. Thank you for joining and thank you, God for always for us. Amen. Our church is sustained through this wilderness time by your faithful generosity. You can continue to send your offerings by mail, or for more information about setting up an electronic funds transfer, contact Roberta Kent or Pastor Odney. Please join with me for the offering prayer. We can only present what you freely give, gracious God. We express our faith, our thanksgiving in these offerings, that the church may continue to witness your justice through the law, the prophets, and the gospel of your liberating Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, oh, we enjoyed today's strange encounter of giants and the scene and the recovery from the scene. Today is a time with, uh, with the Christ and we find Christ in all we do. May this week uh, give you joy and break the chains of any burden and the, uh, and the bondage that you are going through. May in God, the Creator, give 
uh, and take, uh, give you the grace and Jesus Christ gives an assurance of his salvation and the Holy Spirit joins you in every lasting presence of God. Amen.